public and our stories just begun. Hello everyone, this is Automatic, and welcome to episode 3 of Engines of Union Pacific. Today, we will not be talking about one, but two engines, and for a special reason that I'll mention later. Anyways, yes, today the engines we're looking at, that we're talking about, are of course the GP-35 and the DD-35 locomotives. So without further ado, let's start the talk about these two engines because it's quite an interesting story. Our story begins in 1963. Which, at this time, if you remember, EMD GP30s were doing really well on lots of railroads. However, during this time, Electromotive Division was looking, for, was looking into the production of another new locomotive design. In a way, it would be like an, an enhanced version of the famous GP30 from 1962. And of course... The result was the GP-35, with the first one being built in July of 1963. They had quite a few improvements compared to the GP-30s. The GP-35s weighed 260,000 pounds, or 117,934 kilograms. They had a length of 56 feet 2 inches or 17.12 meters and a width of 10 feet 4 inches or 3.15 meters. The GP35 had a V16 diesel engine in it which is an engine with 16 cylinders. The GP35 had a top speed of 65 miles per hour or 105 kilometers an hour. The GP35 was rated for 2,500 horsepower, which was more than the, which was more powerful than the GP30, which was only rated for 2,250 horsepower. They also had a tractive effort of 50 of 50,000 pounds per square inch when moving. Now, the one thing that made the GP35 stand out from other diesels at the time was the cab design. Just like the GP30, specifically the cab roof design. For an example, here's a GP20, GP30, and GP35 all side by side together. The GP20 had a rounded cab roof, like many of the older diesels. The GP30 had the classic hump on its cab roof, which makes it, you know, very recognizable. And the GP35 had the roof that many modern diesels have today, which is what I like to call the trapezoid cab roof, simply because it looks like a trapezoid shape. The GP35 was actually one of the first freight diesels to to actually have the trapezoid shaped cab roof. Despite the different looks compared to the GP30, the locomotive was still a well built diesel design. The GP stood for general purpose 
and 35 meant the model type, which means that it was model number 35. In total, Electromotive Division built 1,334 GP35s between July 1963 to January 1966. GP35s were used in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And in total, 40 railroads bought GP35s for their rosters. I would go over them. I would go over them all, but we're mainly focused on only one rail railroad right now, and of course, that railroad, of course, is the Union Pacific. During the mid-1960s, Union Pacific decided that diesel power was the way to go. I would go over why they started to pan away from the turbines, but I've already talked about it in the previous episodes. So if you want to know why they panned away from the turbines, go check out the two previous episodes, mainly episode one of this series. Anyways, let's get into the topic of this video. Union Pacific was in need of more engines for their roster. And of course, the GP35 was one of the choices that they could buy. So it was settled. And they bought 24 GP35 locomotives from EMD in 1963. Their engines were numbered from 740 to 763. Keep in mind, these were likely ordered after a different batch of engines had the numbers 736 to 739 because these engines follow close behind the numbers of the GP30s. Anyways, um, we're, we're getting sidetracked. Let's talk about what, you, what the Union Pacific used their GP35s for. The Union Pacific used GP35s for freight service and were also used as yard switchers, aka shunters, from time to time. They would then be one of the more frequently frequently used diesels during the 60s and 70s, perhaps. It is estimated that the Union Pacific GP35s at least had a mileage travel of at least 1 million miles or so in their career. But I'm not too sh but it's unsure. But I'm going to assume because most Union Pacific engines traveled at least 1 million miles in their career. However, the Union Pacific GP35s would not have the same history as the older GP30s, and uh, well, you'll hear later on why. Union Pacific's GP35s were most likely equipped with RS3L air horns. Here's an example of that of that of those horns. Now, you're all probably wondering why I included these two why I included two engines instead of one into one episode. Well, the reason for that the reason for why is because I'm going to say this now. The DD35 is actually it's also a GP35 as well, but with some modifications. How the production of the engine happened is an interesting story. When the GP35 was first built, some of them were given a special trailing unit for extra strength or extra horsepower. This unit was of course called the DD35 unit. However, the units were not drivable due to their not being a cab because when they were first built, they originally were supposed to be used as just trailing units, and because of that, there was no need for a cab. They were just used for extra horsepower. 
When the GP35 and DD35 were both in production at that time, two railroads decided to also buy the DD35 units for their rosters. And of course, the railroads were the Southern Pacific and, of course, the Union Pacific. Southern Pacific ordered three of them, numbered 8400 to 8402, and Union Pacific ordered 27 of them, numbered 72B to 98B. And yes, these units were built around the same time as the GP35s. However, the most noticeable thing with the DD35 that made it stand out from other things was that it was made up of two units on one frame. They also had four axle trucks under them instead of two axle trucks like on the GP35. To put it this way, the DD35 is a GP35 that's much longer and much stronger. Well, uh, well, I'll get into that in just a minute. <laughs> Union Pacific ordered these units for 1,500 horsepower freight trains. Now for its information. The DD-35 was capable of 5,000 horsepower. So like I said before, they would only be used at the time as trailing units for extra power. However, the one downfall with these units at the time was uh, was the wheel arrangement. The four axle trucks on the DD-35s were a rigid piece instead of a flexible piece like on the early gas turbines. And because they had four axles on each truck, every time they would go around a curve, it would cause stress on the pivot joint, which is what is, which is what's used to allow the trucks to twist in, on curves. Not just that, but crew, but also crews argued about the sand the sand from their sandboxes because of the sand from their from the internal sandboxes getting in in the electrical gear. So new so new sandboxes were fitted on the walkways in 1969. They were among the last EMD road units to be built with DC generators and old-fashioned switchgear, which were more maintenance-intensive than the later AC-slash-DC equipment. However, before these changes were done, four years prior to this, there was one more thing that done with the DD-35 that Union Pacific wanted to experiment on. They wanted to try out these en these units, but as controllable engines, it, which means they wanted to tr they wanted these engines with cabs fitted on them, and so it was settled. In 1965, EMD made another batch of 15 more DD-35s that were numbered 70 to 84. However, these units, unlike the other ones, were fitted with cabs. They took a GP35 cab and put it on a DD35. They looked very similar to the other DD35s, but of course they had a cab, and the ones from before didn't. They also had the same trucks as the others, and now I should mention that the trucks that they used were called 4-axle flex coil trucks. Okay, I know what you're saying. You just said they weren't flexible enough, like the like the ones on the early gas turbines. Okay, well, listen, I don't know how those things work, alright? Anyways, these DD-35s are also were rated for 5,000 horsepower, just like the other ones. However, they had a slightly longer frame because of the cab. Their fuel tanks were slightly larger than the others, simply because they were, of course, you know, drivable engines, because, uh... Well, because they're drivable, they need more fuel because, you know, they're going to be controlled. They weighed 519,353 pounds or 235,575 kilograms. They had a length of 88 feet 2 inches 
or 26.87 meters, and a width of 10 feet 4 inches or 3.15 meters. The top speed is believed to be the same as the GP35, which is 65 miles per hour, but I'm not exactly sure. Anyways, the other thing was that was different was their name. Since one version had a cab and the other one didn't, as you know, usually they would call, you know, the ones with cabs A units and the ones without cabs B units, they decided to call the one with the, with the cab the DD35A because of the cab. Now for the reason why they called it a DD35. I'm going to say this right off the bat that DD does not stand for double diesel, like many people think it does. DD actually stands for the arrangement of trucks and powered axles. So DD means there are two trucks and each truck has four powered axles. Once again, the 35 meant what model version it was. Just like the GP35, it was model number 35. The DD35As were fitted with Leslie Super Typhon model S5TRRO or S3LR horns. Here's a sample of those air horns. <laughs> The DD-35s and DD-35As would often be seen mostly on Sherman Hill during the 1960s and early 1970s. However, the DD-35, of course, wasn't the best designed diesel locomotive that the Union Pacific actually had, considering the problems these engines had in the first place, and not to mention, in 1969, EMD created a much better designed double diesel unit than the DD-35, which was called the DDA-40X or DD-40AX or DD-40X or simply the Centennial, which was built for the 100th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike in 1969, to celebrate 100 years since 1869. By the mid-1970s, both the Southern Pacific and Union Pacific were becoming unsatisfied with their DD-35 units, and so they decided to start withdrawing them. By 1978, the Southern Pacific retired all three of their DD-35s, and scrapped all three of them. and the DD-35s that belonged to the Union Pacific were also retired and scrapped in 1977. And when I meant by all of them, I meant the original ones. Because, in fact, however, 
the Union Pacific would actually still keep their DD-35A units for a little longer, but not for too long. The DD-35As still ran on the on their roster up until the 1980s, when the Union Pacific finally decided to retire them as they were starting to become obsolete and outdated. In their final months of service, they mainly operated around Salt Lake City, Utah. But finally, in 1981, all DD-35As were retired from service. Despite the DD-35 and DD-35A's problems, they still did well on the Union Pacific and would always go down as an important engine in the railroad's history. But, sadly, not one of the DD-35s or DD-35As were ever preserved and have all fallen to the scrapper's torch. So sadly, there are no examples of a DD-35 or DD-35A left in existence. So, which basically means DD-35s go down as an extinct locomotive. Hearing that a DD-35 never made it to preservation is definitely heartbreaking to many rail fans. And I can only imagine how heartbroken some feel hearing that a, a famous locomotive never made it to preservation. It's definitely a sad thing to hear. Considering that it was one of, if not the first, double diesel units. It's such a shame that it never made it to preservation, one of these engines. They were a perfect opportunity for preservation. But it never happened. It's really sad. However, although they may be all gone, their legacy is not gone. In fact, people have made many, have recreated many examples of the DD-35 locomotives in all sorts of ways to, to keep the legacy alive. The locomotive has been recreated in train games. Created 
it as a model train. So although they may all be gone, we still have plenty of examples of of replicas in a, in di of different replicas of the of the locomotive rep represented in different forms. Whether as a computer gen as a whether whether as a computer created model or a model created model. Now, you're all probably asking, what about the GP35 locomotives, since I haven't talked about them in a little bit? Well, the GP35s are a bit more difficult to explain because, well, their histories, all their histories could have been different, because they most likely they could have either been sold off to other railroads, rebuilt into different engines, or simply just scrapped. I do know, however, that they were retired in the late 1980s, so, yeah. But once again, I don't know what happened to them after their retirement. However, the, however, the one exception that I can say is engine number 741, which was confirmed scrapped. The others, I'm not so sure about. But thankfully, we still have plenty of examples of the GP35 locomotives from other railroads that are still around to this day. And I'll say this. Although the DD35s are all gone, their legacy still lives on in the GP35. Simply because it's what gave it's what the DD35 was based off of. Sort of. And that is something we should be glad for. And you never know. Someone might come along someday and make a build a complete replica of a brand new DD-35 or DD-35A. You never know. But either way, we can all say, however, that the chapter of another type of engine, specifically two engines, has closed and has come to an end for the Union Pacific. Although lo those locomotives are, although those locomotives are gone, they will never be forgotten, and that is something we need to make sure of. Serving the Union Pacific since 19 from 1964 to 1981 the DD-35s and GP-35s. And just like that, there you go, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the third episode of Engines of Union Pacific. The next episode, we will talk about two engines once again, the U-50 and the U-50C. Stay tuned for that, and make sure to stick around on this channel for those bit for that episode because you're not gonna want to miss. You're not. You're not. You're gonna wish you don't want. You're gonna wish that you didn't miss it. Didn't miss this. Didn't miss the premiere when you got when you when it was premiering. Well, when it will premiere, which will probably be a month or so from now, because it seems like every episode seems to release every month or so after the other but anyways yeah stay tuned and stick around on this channel because there's lots of interesting train content from just the train games and stuff so anyways with that said hope to see you guys in the next episode and so with that said I hope you guys enjoyed this video and until next time this is automatic Signing off!